all right, well, you have your data. Now it's time to actually learn something about it. Um, so that's where data processing comes in. And we're going to take a pretty high level look at these different methods of processing because they are very technical. If you are, say, a manager of a business intelligence system, this is the kind of thing that you would be hiring people to do, not necessarily doing yourself. But it is important that you recognize these concepts. So let's get into it. There's three types of analysis that we're going to be talking about. There's reporting, there's data mining, and there's big data. Reporting analysis uh, specifically is for structured data. You take structured data and you sort it, group it, sum it, and filter it. And this is actually a lot of the kind of stuff that you'll be doing using Microsoft Excel. So it's actually very good timing that we're talking about this at the same time as we are introducing Microsoft Excel. Now, I highly recommend that you do read Experiencing MIS Chapter 3 in its entirety. There's a lot of really good information that I'm not able to cover in my videos. The career guide, I think, is really good for this one. You have someone talking about their own personal experience with business intelligence systems. Highly recommend it. There's also real life examples. Um, my videos are supplementary to all of that. In particular, what I recommend you do is read section 3.2 because that example gives you a really good example of reporting analysis. I'll give a very high level overview of what's going on there, but it's a really good illustration. All right, so we're back to this data again. Um, what we have is a bike company that, or a bike part company that sells, well, bike parts to different people, but what they're looking at getting into now is whether or not they should offer 3D part designs so that companies would be able to print their own bike parts. And what they realize is that they want to target big companies because the smaller companies are going to be less likely to, you know, actually be able to obtain a 3D printer or actually have one already. Big companies are going to be more likely to have a 3D printer or be able to get one if they so choose. They also want to look at specific parts, uh, ones that are lightweight, so their shipping cost isn't too high. And those uh, would actually be a lot easier to 3D print because they are not very you know, heavy, you know, they don't have a lot of material. So those are the two factors that they want to look at in order for figuring out, should we try to offer 3D uh, part designs? So what we have here is uh, all of this customer information in the original graph. Uh, this is all compressed to get, for every single customer, all of the revenue that they are giving this bike company, as well as the, all of the units that they have bought, and then the average, um, price per unit for each of those customers. And with this information, what they're able to do is identify which customers are bringing in the most revenue. Whereas over here, there were a lot of um, orders for customers, multiple orders per customer with all that information kind of fragmented. So they were able to convert it into something much more useful that they could then do calculations on. And in the example, they're able to say, okay, well, we're going to define our big customers as giving us more than $200,000 in revenue. And that is a lot easier to find. You could easily sort this table to see who is giving you the highest revenue and the lowest revenue, and then filter out all the customers who are giving you less than 200,000. Filtering refers to just removing items that don't match a particular criteria. In this case, we're filtering out customers who are have less than $200,000 in revenue here. All right, so now because this company is trying to 3D print this stuff, they're trying to find parts that, well, make sense for them to sell 3D printed designs for. So they want to sell parts that they don't get a lot of orders for which means that then they wouldn't have to keep stuff in stock, in stock just in case someone buys it once in a blue moon. Uh, they want to do cheap items as well because, 
well, if it was expensive, they could possibly be losing out on a lot of money. And then the shipping weight, uh, they want it to be low shipping weight so that it doesn't require a lot of material in the actual part itself. So these are all the parts that they have uh, based on the number of orders that they get, the average order size, the unit parts, and the shipping weight. They're able to filter out all the parts that are too heavy or worth too much or have a large order size or have a large number of orders. And that filtering is another part of this reporting analysis. And then you have a chart with revenue potential for all of these parts. If they continued to keep selling these parts as is, how much revenue could they expect to make off of those parts? This is revenue that they could possibly be losing out on if they start selling 3D printed designs instead. So it could really help inform, you know, do we actually choose these parts for 3D printing or do we continue to stock these? And that's not necessarily a either we print all of these or, or sorry, we sell all the designs or we stock all the parts. You know, you could look at, say, part 300-1016 and say, well, we're making a not insignificant amount of money off of that, so maybe we stock that one. But part 200, 205, maybe we do sell the print designs for that so we don't have to worry about ordering it and all that kind of stuff. So that's an example of information you can get from reporting analysis. The next type of analysis we got is data mining analysis. We take in a whole bunch of data and we apply statistics across that data to try to find patterns and relationships for classification and prediction. Can we say classify our customers into certain groups and from there understand you know, how better to market to them or something like that? Can we predict trends in the uh, social media landscape in order for us to better design our products or something like that. These are questions that data mining can really help answer. So you have all of these pieces that interact with data mining analysis. You have things like statistics and mathematics, which you're actually using for the analysis. You have the huge databases because you're applying this over, well, a lot of data. The more data you have, the better predictions you're able to get using data mining. Uh, with processing power becoming cheaper, data storage becoming cheaper, and the price of large data sets becoming cheaper partially as a, re as a result of all of that, uh, this all leads to an increase in how much data mining is being used nowadays. Um, you have business professionals, including in marketing and finance, getting more and more comfortable with the idea of data mining, uh, maybe even using some of the systems if they are systems that have user-friendly interfaces. Uh, data management technology uh, becoming more and more powerful also contributes to data mining uh, as, that, as that improves, as it's easier for us to store and catalog and manage our data, it's easier for us to actually analyze it. And of course, artificial intelligence and specifically machine learning, which is a subproblem of that, contributes to data mining as well. We can build artificial intelligence systems that actually do data mining functions. And that's a very complicated topic. The last video that we'll be covering in this whole series of videos, we'll talk more about artificial intelligence and specifically machine learning. Now we have two types of data mining, uh, unsupervised data mining and supervised data mining. The idea with unsupervised data mining is you, you get all of your data and then you immediately start applying statistical analysis, you know, data mining techniques. You're going to look at what happens when you just apply all of that stuff to data mining and you're going to look for patterns and once you actually find the patterns in that data ideally then you would want to you know create and test a hypothesis about those patterns you want to actually double check that those patterns are there but unsupervised data mining is really helpful when it comes to looking for patterns in data that might not be immediately obvious especially if you have a lot of data 
um, it can be really hard to find patterns uh, as a human. So data mining can be really helpful there. Now, one type of unsupervised data mining is what's known as cluster analysis. It's statistical techniques that help identify groups of entities that have similar characteristics. So an example of this is if you have certain groups of customers, you might want to identify and group them together so you can figure out like, hey, these are the people that are buying from my store. And if you get good enough cluster analysis, you can actually get hyper specific about the different consumer bases of your store. Uh, maybe you have uh, grandmas who like chihuahuas and enjoy knitting blankets is one cluster that you can identify. And the other one is uh, punk rock, uh, punk rock musicians who also love knitting blankets or scarves or something like that. Uh, those are your two big demographics then you know, you can really target things to each of those demographics and have grandma and chihuahua knitting and punk rock musician knitting as your main advertising campaigns for your business. And given that those are probably your demographics, I would hope that you actually uh, follow up and test and make sure that those demographics are real and not a fluke. Uh, Given that those are your demographics, uh, those, that will probably be a relatively successful set of advertising campaigns. Now, when we talk about stuff like unsupervised data mining, I do want to briefly bring up the idea of correlation versus causation. What I have here is a um, graph that shows the number of math doctorates awarded in the United States per year and the amount of uranium stored at US nuclear power plants per year. And you can see you have two very similar looking graphs and statistical analysis shows that they are indeed very correlated. Does this imply that we should store a lot of uranium, like we should have a lot of uranium everywhere so that we produce more and more and more math? doctorates? Or does it imply that the more people get math doctorates, the more uranium we start stockpiling in our power plants? No, neither of those are actually truly connected. But statistically, it is easy to say that they are connected statistically. In fact, this graph talks about, uh, this picture talks about a correlation of 95.23%, which is, uh, which would in statistical terms, imply that they are highly, highly correlated with each other and that there is a possible causation thing. We know that there's not. We know that neither of these cause the other. So when we're talking about the statistical techniques of data mining, this idea is something that we should really keep in mind, where it's really easy to see things that are correlated. It's easy for us to see patterns, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there's a causation going on. Just in the same way that uranium doesn't cause more people to get math doctorates, um, we can't necessarily say that our consumer base is grouped into these particular groupings necessarily. That's why we have to check our results. That's why we have to actually test them. Now we've got our other type of data mining, our supervised data mining, and this actually puts a lot more control in the people who are working with analyzing the data. Because after they acquire the data, they create the hypothesis first. They look at it, they say, I think that a lot of people who are punk rock musicians and like knitting shop from our store. With that hypothesis, they're able to perform a statistical analysis. They perform the right statistical analysis for that particular problem. And then they can test the accuracy of the results afterwards using the correct tests for the particular statistical analysis that they perform. So rather than just feeding in a lot of data and seeing what sticks, you know, you were actually saying, I think 
this is happening, let's collect some data, let's perform a statistical analysis, and let's actually see if that's what's going on. That's the big difference here, is the intentionality of it, whether you are just going about it willy-nilly, or whether you have a hypothesis and you're trying to see if the data backs that up. An example of supervised data mining is regression analysis. You create a mathematical equation to predict the value of one variable based on the values of others. The example they give in the textbook is uh, a company thinks that the their customers' weekend cell phone usage is determined by the customer age and the number of months that they have the cell phone account. And in this example, they perform a statistical analysis and they get a uh, equation that looks like cell phone weekend minutes equals 12 plus 17.5 times the customer's age plus 23.7 times the account months, given the existing customer info. And of course, what they would do is they would take this, um, they, they would take this regression they would take this possible equ uh, equation and they would do a statistical test to see if that equation actually is accurate for their customers or if it's um, because there's a way for equations like this to be incorrect in a way that makes them look correct I guess uh, if you have a whole bunch of customers who use um, a lot of cell phone weekend minutes and a whole bunch of customers that use a little bit of cell phone weekend minutes and you get this equation out of it, it sort of tries to go between the two sets of customers in a way that doesn't actually model their behavior. It's just sort of a halfway point between the two sets of customers here. So you can get errors with regression. You can get errors with any sort of statistical analysis. Regardless, if we were to test this and if it were to come out that this is a good test, then what a equation like this would do is say, if we bring on a new customer who is 50 years old, uh, we can use that age and assume that in five months they would be using, you know, 17.5 times 50 plus 23.7 times five plus 12 uh, amount of minutes over the weekend. So what this lets us do is it lets us Based on our existing customer base, we can look at theoretical new customers and see what their weekend usage minutes will be as they age and as the amount of time they've held the account goes up. Now, the last type of analysis is big data. This is a term that gets thrown around quite a bit. It refers to data collections that are really big huge volume uh, at greater than or equal to one petabyte. Now a petabyte is a thousand terabytes, which is a million gigabytes, which is a billion megabytes, which is then a trillion kilobytes, a quadrillion bytes, if I have my math right, my powers of 10. Data that is just at an incomprehensible scale. I have a hard time filling up like two terabytes in my hard drive at home. Google has so, 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 so many petabytes of data. This kind of stuff is just completely inaccessible to people. Um... The velocity refers to how big the data sets grow. How much, how much uh, data are you collecting every single day? For something like Google or Amazon or Facebook, it's a lot of data every week. It's growing very, very, very quickly. And then the high variety is essentially how many attributes do you have with Something like Google is going to be a lot of different attributes because they're trying to keep track of everything, essentially. There's also a lot of sources and a lot of forms of data, both structured and unstructured data, whether that's going to be photos or web searches or emails or all kinds of stuff. Google's looking at everything. 
there. They're trying to keep track of everything. They don't need to worry about having too much data because they have the processing power and data storage that can handle it. They're, they're fine. They'll be totally fine. Not even a problem. And they keep everything just in case they can squeeze another cent out of advertising to you or selling your data to someone else. So that that's that's big data. It's incomprehensible. Now with the other forms of analysis, we were able to do it using maybe a couple computers or something. Uh, the reports we can do on like an Excel spreadsheet. Data mining you could probably do on like one computer or a cloud server or something like that. You can't do that with big data because it's at such a scale that one single machine can't actually handle it. You need thousands of computers typically working in servers, but these thousands of computers working in parallel to analyze the amount of data that you have. Working with big data here requires experts with deep technical skills and a lot of money. You need a lot of money to work with big data. Typically, you will not be doing that. Typically, you will be either buying subsets of data from Google, very, very small subsets, or you will be buying their own analysis or just using your own, uh, like it's giving them your advertising materials or something like that so that they just handle it on their end. That's the amount of stuff that they have. This is out of reach for most people. Now, in order to process big data, you can't process that all on one machine, which is a problem if you're Google and you have all that data. So you need to split it across multiple machines. And they use a process known as map reduce. So the map part of this is you take your collection of data and you break it into fragments. Then you assign every computer that you're working with, say like all of the millions of computers in your server farms, uh, you'll be assigning each one of those pieces, a, a piece of your collection. And then you give that computer its fragments so that the computer can process it. So you break the collection to fragments, you assign every fragment to a computer, and then you actually deliver the, frag the fragment to that computer. You are mapping the fragments to different computers, essentially. And then with reducing, you're kind of undoing the process. You wait for the computers to signal that they are done, because you know it'll take a, quite a bit of time for the computers to be done. And then for every computer that signals that they're done, you're going to collect their results, because they'll give some sort of statistical analysis thing out. Uh, it's probably going to be some sort of unsupervised data mining, or some maybe a supervised data mining as well. Uh, unsupervised works really well for big data. That's typically the kind of thing that they do is unsupervised data mining across all this data. But yeah, you, you collect the results from each of the computer that signals that they're done. And then you combine all of those results. You're reducing all those fragments into one useful thing, one useful result. So that's map reduce. You're breaking everything up, giving them to all the computers that you have working for you. And then you uh, take the results of that and you combine it into one thing. This is a huge oversimplification, by the way, because each one of these three steps per part that I list is insanely complicated. Just the breaking of your collection into fragments itself can be such a pain because you need to figure out how to do that. You need to find the pieces that are best to break or the pieces that are best to keep together. Or the coordination between all the different computers is really rough. Uh, combining the results can be tricky as well because um, you know you don't want to necessarily wait for all the computers to signal that they're done because one of them could run into trouble and may never signal that you're done and you don't want to wait for that so you might have to give up at a certain point there's all these different algorithms that are coming in play like this is really complicated there's so much money sunk into this process of map and reduce because they have that kind of money to do it i mean they they can actually do big data for pete's sake like 
there's a lot of money that went into this, and that's why these systems are so advanced. Here's an example, uh, just a diagram that illustrates everything. You have a log of a whole bunch of searches. You break that log up into segments. You process each of those segments with the different processors. In this case, when they're talking about like processor, they're talking about like uh, actual individual computers here. And then what they're able to do, what they're doing here is they're counting the number of times that each search term has been given. And those search terms they're going to, uh, each processor is going to give its individual table of search term counts. So it's like, okay, I saw Hadoop 14 times, healthcare 85 times, hiccup 17 times, and so on and so forth. But all of these processors have seen some of these uh, some terms that other processors have seen as well. So like Hadoop shows up in one and two, Hurricane shows up in 9,555 plus or minus and one. Uh, healthcare shows up in one and two as well. Honda shows up in two and 9,555. So you have to reduce all of this by essentially, you know, you look at all the tables and you say, okay, Hadoop shows up 14 times here and three times here. And X times here, Y times here, Z times here, uh, all that kind of stuff. And you put it in your final results table to say Hadoop shows up uh, 10,418 times. Now, because there's so many tables and each of those tables have so much information in them, there's a lot of really crazy techniques that go into the actual combination of all of these so that you save memory, um, you save time, as you save processor uh, power, all that kind of stuff. Regardless, that's big data. And with that, that is all of the data analysis discussion that we'll be doing. The three pieces are the reporting analysis, the data mining analysis, and big data analysis. Those are the three you'll encounter, and the two you'll realistically work with are reporting analysis and data mining analysis. And yeah, more details on how to do all of that are going to come in the future if you continue along things like information science, or it will come with, you know, you hiring someone to do that kind of stuff for you if you're in a managerial position. But knowing those techniques and knowing that you need to look out for someone who knows about, say, data mining is really important. And that's what we're trying to do here in this overview is give you things that you should keep in mind going forward no matter what role you end up in. But yeah, data analysis.